Hey guys, what's up and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hey, I'm Liz. This is Creating Crime Time where I'm your host and uh, basically I sit down and I talk to you about a true crime story and I create a work of art at the same time. So if you're interested and you want to keep supporting my channel, hit that like button. Don't forget to hit that red subscribe button and turn your bell notification on to all. That way you know when I upload. So, exorcisms. <sighs> Figured, you know what? Let's start, let's talk about something different. I did a whole strand of unsolved cases for the last week of my 25 days of true crime. So I was like, you know what? What about exorcisms? People don't really talk about them. That and I mean they get a bad rap because, you know, exorcisms, but still. So the two case, two first case we're going to be talking about is the case of Annalise Michelle, or as it's famously known as the exorcism of Emily Rose, which is the American adaptation of the case of Anna Elizabeth Michelle, or Annalise is what she went by. So, oh, this poor girl. If people just listened to her, I think everything would have been okay. But, anywho, so who is Annalise Michelle? Well, she was born Anna Elizabeth Michelle, and she. She was born to parents Joseph and Anna Michelle, and she was born on the 21st of September of 1952 in Liebelfing, Bavaria, West Germany. Her family was a devout Roman Catholic family, and they, her parents had four daughters. They often went to Mass twice a week. They were a very religious family. Her her family dynamic was pretty normal. They were all very, like, tight-knit, and the four girls were always together. They all went to services together. You know, the normal. That is until Annalise is 16, and this is when she suffers her first seizure. And after the seizure, this is when she is diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Shortly after this, she is also diagnosed with depression and she is being treated by a psychiatric hospital. Well, by the time she was 20, she became super intolerant of any religious items, which is really hard to like understand because she's a she comes from a very devout Roman Catholic family and a lot of this is brought on by her psychosis or her being possessed by a demon but before we get into that let's uh let's backtrack so obviously we know she is in a very devout Roman Catholic family so, when she was 16, she had her first seizure, or her first severe convulsion, and this is obviously when she's diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. So, that didn't stop her. She ended up graduating from her secondary school, or like a high school alternative, whatever they call it in Germany, and she would join the Univers University of Würzburg. Her classmates would later describe her as being very withdrawn and very religious and super quiet. Like, she always just kept to herself. So, in June of 1970, so this is when she is a sophomore, or would be like sophomore age, so like 15, 15, 16. So, generally around the same time. Um, so she would have three convulsions or seizures, and this would be the third one we're talking about. And this is when she is staying at a psychiatric hospital. It's at this time she is prescribed an anti-convulsion drug for the first time. And this is when they introduced Dilantin into the picture, and this didn't alleviate anything. 
if anything, it just made it worse. Like, Elise, literally that same month, like, she said that she was seeing devil faces and everything was just like getting worse and worse and worse. It just, also, they would end up prescribing her another medication and this is called Aalept, which is another form of chlorpromazine. Yeah, chlorpromazine. I think that's how you pronounce the, the generalized name. So this drug is used to help treat various psychosis states, uh, which includes schizophrenia and also includes hallucinations and disturbed behavior and just like severe delusions. This drug helps in that uh, general, if you take upon it, that general idea. It help. It tries to help keep it at bay. Well, by 1973, so when she's in her college, her university, she, obviously suffering de from depression, she begins hallucinating while she's praying. Now, she's a severely religious person, so this is not normal for her. She's hallucinating while she's praying. So something is literally, like, she doesn't know what's wrong. She's literally freaking out. And when she's hallucinating while she's praying, she is hearing voices that are telling her to rot in hell and telling her that she's damned. And when she was asked about it, she, the people took it as her complaining that somebody's talking to her while she's praying. They didn't like, they didn't take it seriously, which they should have. They really should have. <sighs> so... With that being said, <laughs> the treatment that she received didn't help her. Didn't help her at all. Didn't improve her health. It didn't help her depression at all. It worsened. So, um, and also long-term treatment didn't help her either. So at her aftercare, that long-term treatment, nope, didn't help whatsoever. <sighs> Annalise would become severely infuriated when it comes to her medical intervention because here she is taking these this, these medications for about five years now and nothing has come of it and this is when she so right around the five year mark this is when she becomes so intolerant to religious fixtures and sacred places crucifixes are one of them like she can't she can't be around them because it's it's messing with her mind. And so Annalise would accompany a friend, a family friend who organizes pilgrimages, Christian pilgrimages. So they went to San Damiano and it's on this trip. Her escort tells her that they believe she is being possessed by a demon. And this is brought up due to the fact she can't walk past a crucifix and refuses to drink water from the Christian Holy Springs. This is, this is the start of the culmination of everything speaking of exorcisms. So... After this is when, after she returns home, Annalise tells her family and are her, obviously parents are taken aback, but they start talking to members of the community and they're all convinced that they need to go to a priest and ask about an exorcism. Well, the they consulted with several different priests, and most of them said no. Now, because of the priests declining, this is when they 
get the recommendation that they continue with her medical treatment, which is already isn't working. So why continue with something that's not working? And the priests also inform the family that an exorcism needs to have a bishop's consent and permission in order to perform it. So in the Catholic Church, you need to you have to meet a certain criteria in order to receive said exorcism. And they, so basically you have to be considered to be suffering and like being held hostage by a demon in order to be like, oh yeah, you can have an exorcism. <sighs> so, Intense dislike of religious objects, which is something that Annalise is going through. And also, supernatural powers is another indication of a demonic possession. Well, it's during this time when Annalise, her, she worsened physically and she displayed aggression, self-inflicting injuries. She drank her own urine at some points, and she also ate insects. She was, there was definitely something seriously wrong, and they couldn't, they weren't getting the help that they needed, so they just kept trying and trying and trying. And also, in, so in November of 1973, this is when she is, prescribed Tegretol. Now, Tegretol is an anti-seizure drug and a mood stabilizer. She was also prescribed other antipsychotic drugs during the course of the religious rites that she would endure. And she, altogether, it's 67 religious rites that she would go through that would ultimately lead to her death. If you didn't know that, Sorry, that's a spoiler. Annalise Michelle dies. But we'll get there. We will get there. And despite taking these neuroleptic medications, her symptoms worsened and she began to manifest growling and seeing demons and throwing things. So <clears throat> a priest that they were talking to, his name is Priest Ernest Alt. They met. They discussed things, and he stated that she didn't look like an epileptic and that he did not see her having any seizures, but he did believe that she was suffering from demonic possession and urged the local bishop to allow the exorcism. So, yeah, in September of 1975, Bishop Joseph Stangle granted the permission for a priest by the name of Arnold Renz to exercise according to Ritual Romanum of 1614, but he also ordered total secrecy when it came to her exorcism because those were not really things that were talked about because if you talked about an exorcism, boom, you were instantly in the nut house. It wasn't something that was very, like, talked about at all. So Arnold Renz performed his first session on Annalise on the 24th of September of 1975. And Annalise began talking increasingly about dying to atone for the wayward youth of the day and the apostate priests of the modern church. She refused to eat towards the end of her lifespan, and towards the end, her parents stopped consulting with doctors and on her, on Annalise's request. She, she didn't want any more medical treatment. She was done so with it. So her parents, her parents agreed, and she stopped. She just stopped having any any doctor's orders, any medication, any of it. And this is when Annalise relied solely on the ritual 
rites and the exorcism rites that were being like imposed on her. So as I said, 67 exorcism sessions happened. Uh, it was about one or two a week. They lasted about four hours a day or four hours at a time. And they were performed over a course of 10 months between 1975 and 1976. So they started in September and they would end in July. So on the 1st of July of 1976, Annalise died in her home. So her autopsy states that her cause of death is malnutrition and dehydration, which is a result from nearly a year in a semi-starved state while the rites of exorcism were happening. She weighed about 66 pounds when she died and she suffered from broken knees and this is due to her constantly being in a they call it a genifle genifleccious yeah gen genifleccious state so basically her kneeling her knees just they broke they became too brittle she was unable to move by herself she needed assistance and it <clears throat> was also known that she had contracted pneumonia before her death so After her death, the priest that performed the exorcism was arrested, he was put to trial, and it was between, they basically, they charged Annalise's parents and the priest Ernst Alt and Arnold Renz with negligent homicide. And basically it's because she died under their care she was i mean 66 pounds like but at the same time Annalise is an adult so it's really <sighs> it's hard to discuss things when it's not your own child that is going th or went through this because I mean, they all believed that she was possessed by a demon, and all the things that she put her body through is basically what culminated to her death. And it's really, really sad to read about and to see, especially even the depiction. If you haven't seen The Exorcism of Emily Rose, it is, I found it like very fascinating as a movie. A lot of people didn't like it because they thought it was very cheesy and very like, <laughs> but I think Jennifer Carpenter did a really good job. They did a nice little like memorial for Annalise in the movie, which was very nice. <sighs> but yeah. So anywho, basically what had happened is that During the trial is when they played the tapes from her exorcism, and I listened to one of the audio recordings, and man, that is wild. That's wild. And they, they also determined that she was possessed by six different demons. I do have their names written down. That way I wouldn't forget them. And they are Cain, Nero, Fleshman, Judas, Iscariot, Lucifer, and Hitler. Man, the ones you want to, like, they're all creepy AF, but Hitler and Lucifer, man, those are good. Like, and you can hear, like, I heard a clip of her real voice. She has got a very feminine voice, and then when you hear her talking in tongues, basically, um, under another, like, under a demon, man, it gets, like, pretty wild and pretty intense, so. Oh. And basically, like, one of the sessions is the demons arguing, so it's not just her being possessed by one at once. There's multiple going on at the same time. It's really messed up. Like, I feel bad for the girl's vocal cords because they probably hurt. 
So, with that being said, they're, they were all convicted of negligent homicide, but they were all given suspended prison sentences. And they were all ordered to share the costs of the proceedings, so they all had to pay for it. Um, people did say that the sentences that were handed out should have been stiffer, but... Basically, the prosecutor, person who prosecuted this case, asked that the parents and the priest to only be fined. They could be found guilty, but not to be punished, because they're already being punished because Annalise is, has passed away. The Catholic Church also approved such a, like, approving of such an old, like, fashioned exorcism, right? The public would, like, public eye was drawn on them, and media attention was drawn on them. So, this, a lot of this backfired on the Catholic Church, and it, they really, I mean, they've had a lot of downward spirals, don't get me wrong, if you don't just look it up. Just look up the Catholic Church. You'll go down a rabbit hole. It's nuts. But a lot of people think that her case basically is just misidentif misidentification of mental illness and that she wasn't possessed by a demon. Um, each person is going to think something different. It's not everybody's right in one way, everybody's wrong in another way. It all depends on who you are talking to when it comes to these cases, and... It's... <sighs> yeah. Yeah. Also, the band that I went and saw, they are from Salem, Massachusetts. They are called Ice Nine Kills. They used audio clippings of her exorcism in their song called The Communion of the Cursed. Now, th they also did a, they did a song on what we're going to be discussing in our next video, which is another exorcism. So you have to stay tuned to actually like understand what I'm talking about. But I wanted to cover this case because this is a different case. It's not your generalized murder case, an unsolved case. This is a solved case, but it still has a lot of questions whether it comes to was it really possession or was it just mental illness. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you guys in our next video for The True Life Exorcist. Bye!